Hello everybody, this is Juan Carlos Brando and we are talking from Ms. Margaret Wong office. She's an immigration attorney that has been working for more than four decades. And today is a very special day uh, since a lot of things are going on, but also um, there's good news happening. It's not all bad news in the United States. There are some good news coming our way and we know better times are coming. But let's talk to uh, Ms. Margaret Wong, who has been working in uh, immigration law for more than 40 years. And uh, she has been really, really excited today about the good news. Good, mo uh, good afternoon, Ms. Wong. How are you feeling now? I'm good. And I'm so happy. I'm even thinking of giving myself a little break just to go home or go shopping or something this afternoon because DACA passed. It's so exciting. Yesterday, we have the gay rights on Title VII. After 50 years, the 1964 uh, Title VII Civil Rights Act, and today, U.S. Um, Supreme Court came up with DACA. So 800,000 young people who have this work permit for two years, they are protected. At this point, all we know, because the decision is very, very thick, I'm still in the process of uh, reading it and understanding it. But right now, with Chief Justice John Roberts, and let me give him a shout out. Thank you, Chief Justice. And thank you for four other justices in U.S. Supreme Court. It's always my dream to be one, not even in U.S. Supreme Court, to be a judge anywhere. But foreign borns like us, we never made those jobs. Now, the children of foreign-borns could get one of these jobs. I mean, that's awesome. So now, what that means is DACA young people can protect and keep extending the two-year work permit. It doesn't give you the right to vote. It doesn't give you the right to commit crimes. It doesn't give you the right to travel. It only gives you the right to get a social security number, and to file tax return and to pay tax and to get a job and to work. So this is very exciting news because we were worried that these 800 young people, 800,000 young people will be deported by our president. Yes, and Ms. Wong, this is very interesting because we know there are people that are from many, many countries. So uh, the good news applies for uh, people from India that came when they were uh, kids. And uh, what other countries apply in this kind of uh, benefit? DACA, most DACA kids are from Latino countries, Mexico, Salvador, Guatemala. The reason being that, number one, it's very difficult for children under the age of 16 from China, from India, from Russia, from different parts, Middle East to come to America at that age because number one, they couldn't get a visa. Number two is it's very hard to come undocumented illegally because most of us died. Because normally in those days, we come in uh, those containers, like a container on a boat would bring like 300 people, 200 people um, on this big boat and come to Miami or come to New York and then they have to transfer to a small boat or they come with fake passports, I mean foreign passports, not US passports, and then they surrender in the airports. So, um, so what is DACA? DACA means that the person come to America before the age of 16. It has to be before June 15th of 2007. And five years prior to June fifteenth of twenty twelve, that's when the new law came. Not it's really not a law; it's headquarter memo. It's at that time President Obama came out. Have to come to America before the age of sixteen, graduate from high school, and also have to have a GED degree, or if not, at least took courses in GED. Absolutely, absolutely no criminal record. Even a minor, minor uh, misdemeanor or a driving without license may hamper, especially under Trump, on getting under discretion under extension of DACA. I've seen a lot of DACA denials, even under Obama or Trump, if you're driving without a license or, um, or worked without a work permit or stuff like that. So it's really not that easy to get. So the five elements are come to America before June 15th of 2007, never left the country, but on Flutie after 2012, you could have left. 
before the age of 16 and and also a GED or high school graduate and also prove you have to prove your presence um, and also um, no criminal record. So there's a lot of requirements on DACA. So it's not like what people think, oh, it's just to stop deportation for more than 100,000 kids or 800,000 kids. Okay, Ms. Wong, uh, we start, we're starting to get some questions from our audience. And one of the questions is, um, can I apply for my parents if I have DACA? No. 100% no. That's the beauty why both Democrats and Republicans promote DACA. DACA only gives you the right to work. It doesn't really give you a status. It doesn't give you a green card. It doesn't give you a citizenship. So, of course, even a green card cannot sponsor parents, not to say DACA. The answer is no. Okay. Well, if you want further information, uh, just give us a call, 216-279-3984. 216-279-3984 and uh, all questions, if you write them down now on our Facebook Live, uh, are going to be free. So uh, write down your questions right now about DACA or about any other subject in immigration and Ms. Margaret Wong is going to be ready to answer your questions. Um, so we have more questions here coming in uh, to our uh, Facebook. One of them is, um, so can I apply for DACA if I never applied before? That's a very good question. When this case was brought before the Supreme Court, there were three cases that brought up there. DACA really stopped. So you can only do an extension of DACA, but you could not apply for DACA when it's new. So as of that question, I am also searching for answers because we have a lot of clients waiting. Once I know the answer, I would come back to my Facebook. And, and uh, for now, my presumption is yes, but we don't know the answer until USCIS give us more direction. Because let's face it, America is divided into three branches. You have legislative, you have uh, judicial, you also have, oh, I'm so excited, I forgot the third branch. All right, so uh, legislative is a Senate and Congress, judicial is US Supreme Court. So now the US Supreme Court is saying that, oh, the third is executive is President Trump. So Trump now is taking away the right of kids to do DACA except extensions. The court now is saying, well, this is malicious. You cannot just overcome a program from your predecessor, which is Obama, uh, President Obama, you have to have more thought into it. So now the case went back to the Ninth Circuit. It's really that simple. So it really does not say you could do it or you couldn't do it. It just says that the Ninth Circuit is correct in California with that a national hold. So once it goes a remand, now we'll see what the CIS uh, comes up with because CIS reports to Trump. BIA reports to, it's more independent and reports to DOJ. So each of these departments report to different people because CIS reports to DHS, DAH reports to Trump. The boss of DHS directly reports to Trump. And that's why they have four or five DHS heads already since Trump came in. Okay, well, we're receiving a lot of questions right now. So thank you very much, everyone, for uh, texting us and for being connected with Ms. Margaret Wong uh, through our Facebook Live. So. Um, there is a question. I have our case uh, since 2008. Our next hearing court date is July 2021, but my son files I-130 in January. Do we still need to wait for the court or we should have another uh, answer before that? That's a very, very good. So what they ask, this question is parallel track. I already have a removal deportation case in court since 08. So I presume he has a work permit. He didn't say it, but I presume he does. The son now is I over 21 and or over 30 at a case yesterday. The son now is 30, married a citizen, became a citizen. Can he sponsor me here? Because I-130-45 is USCIS. Both of them report to DHS which started under Bush, because before Bush came in, both of these cases are only one immigration office. So it's weird, right? Because on the one hand, I want to deport my guy who, who pays fees. On the other hand, 
my son now is 21, can he sponsor me so I don't get deported? So on this case, it's really a court case. And then on this case, it's a CIA's case. So the, absolutely, now the son needs to file the I-130, and which he filed in January. Do I need to leave the country and be deported for my son to bring me back? The answer is depends on if he has TPS, if he has DACA, if he had legal entry, if he have 245I. If he qualified for these four conditions, he doesn't need to leave the country. Once I get the I-130 approved, I can file the 485 in the court system and stop deportation. But if he entered illegally, if he left and come back after 1998 because of perm bar, if he have no 245I, if he has no TPS, no DACA, no nothing, then this is a case where he's stuck. He either finished a court case because Obama would let us admin close the case and go out and come back. Trump would never admit. It sounds complicated, but it's not, all right, because I've been doing it for more than 40 years. That's why we all went to law school. And that's why we think we are great. I mean, we are very vain. Lawyers are vain people, so we are showing off. So the answer is yes. Uh, I-130 is pending. Once it's approved, you may or may not need to leave the country, but the chances we get the green card is excellent. That's good, and that's really, really good. And thank you very much, Ms. Wong, for this information. Uh, so people are uh, keep telling our comments about the Dreamers. That is a great new one. The Dreamers are uh, really good people. So thank you for those comments. Um, so. Uh, if you need more information, just give us a call, 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984, and we have more questions. In my files, uh, I-130 and I am got it approved, and I am from Mexico, but just recently received a, vo a document from the visa. Uh, I, I don't really understand this question, Ms. Wong. I don't know if... Uh... I think I understand. Yes. Okay. So what he's saying is that the I-130 is approved, so maybe his wife is sponsoring him, his children are sponsoring him. The National Visa Center is called NVC. Once you get the NVC, what we call the packet three and four, but now it's all called one packet in the olden days, it's two packet. Um, so basically now you do the file creation, you have to reopen, it's probably I see the Juarez CDJ number, that's a long number, you need to get to that number, go to the US uh, DOS.gov and file creation. At this point, you give them the one year tax return, you do the DS-260 and you pay them $120 and a $325 fee. The real question is, could I go back to Cedar Juarez or Mexico City for the appointment for the interview? And do I have a qualifying relative to get me a waiver so I can come back with a green card? And that's where the question, I think, stopped. But in response to answer his question, yes, do the file creation, pay the filing fee, and maybe see a good lawyer to see what do I do now. Perfect. That's, that's a very good information. For more information, 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984. Another question from Liliana. She says, uh, good afternoon. I would like to know what's happening with the cases that started this year. We started our case in this year, but we don't know what's going on. Uh, I don't know what case she's talking about. Let's assume she came legally overstayed. So she came on a tourist visa overstayed. Now she married her husband. So now she probably filed I-130, 485. And because of the virus, I don't know if she got a receipt notice. Number one, you get a filing fee receipt notice. And the filing fee is $1,225 for the 485. I-130 is about five or $600. Now you get the receipt. Then included in the fee, you should have filed the I-131 or I-765 I for the work permit and the parole paper. So you should also get those two receipts, but a zero on the receipt notice. I don't know what she got, but the next thing she should get between three weeks to six weeks is a fingerprint notice. And sometimes she gets two because sometimes they'll ask for a fingerprint notice for the work permit. There's a code next to it. It could be zero, it could be one, it could be two, it could be three. So go take the fingerprint. Of course, fingerprint now stopped, all right, because uh, immigration reopened on June 4th. We're still waiting for fingerprint notices to come in. Without that invitation to do fingerprint letter, notice you cannot do a fingerprint. So when he, she says she doesn't know what's going on, it's pretty pending. Lately, it's taking three months for USCIS to give you a fee receipt. 
the easier way to do it, and that's why I always recommend to my clients, the client should pay the filing fee and not trust the lawyers because you could pay me a filing fee. I can ask for a fee waiver so I don't pay a filing fee. Then I eat your money, you see. But anytime whoever paid the filing fee, go to the bank and check the back of the filing fee. Immigration is still old school. They stamp the back of the check and then they'll say case number. With that case number, you go on the web and you can check your case number. Without that receipt and the case number, you couldn't find it on the web. It is awesome uh, the way you explain everything, Ms. Wong. And thank you very much for having so much passion for explaining uh, every immigration detail. Because uh, a lot of people are scared, uh, especially in this time, that immigration has been closed for a while for taking care of people or for receiving people and people uh, sometimes are just uh, going crazy or thinking that their cases are going to be dismissed uh, uh, but it's very very important that people can uh, keep uh, fighting for their cases and then uh, just get in touch with your lawyer and if you don't have one or if you need a second opinion you have Miss Margaret Wong, who has been working for more than 40 years, and her phone number is 216-279-3984, 216-279-3984. So I have another question here, and it says, I have a criminal case because I was doing drag racing in uh, the city of Atlanta. My license was taken away and I was about to be arrested, but they didn't take me because I'm under 18. Uh, what can be the consequences for me in this case that I have DACA? Okay, so number one, you probably will lose your DACA, but lately, and something happened in Atlanta the past two or three years, they're becoming very nice. The court system is still mean, I'm sorry, I hope because we do a lot of cases in France, so don't please get mad at me. I'm just telling people the truth here. But the ICE in Atlanta is becoming nicer and nicer. The ICE, the, the CBP in Atlanta is also very nice because it's an international airport. And I firmly believe if you want the economy of your city to grow, if you want your own airport to increase in international business, you couldn't yell and scream at your constituents of influence who are your customers who come flying in. So we always advise people, Atlanta, one of the best airports for international travelers. Not that they are allowing everybody to come in, but at least they're fair about it. Atlanta ICE also have been very fair in the past two or three years. And yours is the example. You're under 18, you are in drag racing. You had a criminal record, but number one, they did not put you in jail and put you into NTA. That means a removal proceedings. That's very nice. Number two, they also did not immediately cancel your DACA, which is happening in Ohio, in Nashville. Sometimes they just automatically cancel it. And they know they don't have authority because DACA is given by uh, immigration, which is CIS. And whoever picks us up to stop us because the police call them is ICE. Those are two different departments. I mean, they can't just take away something without some due process or some just a cross, you know, but they are starting. So in your case, you're very lucky, but don't do it again. All right. You cannot have a second criminal record and don't be stupid. That's what I mean. You're under 18. I mean, where are your parents? Why didn't you learn from your parents? I mean, we worked so hard to bring you kids to America and you're doing this to me. Are you nuts? So number one, no more criminal record. Number two, you are very lucky to have your DACA. Number three, you need a good lawyer and you need to show them your certified judgment entry and transcript because you're a juvenile, it's easier to get away with it, number one. Number two is we have to find out a way to vacate and see if there's any way to vacate it. And we have to also do some research. Is it a CIMT? That means it's a moral issue or is it um, a, a drug case or something? You know, it's not drugs. But we have to check all that. But hopefully you can protect your DACA. But the good news is you were not detained. They did not NTA you and you still protect your your. DACA until extension. So now wait for 150 days before the new DACA, but make sure a lawyer review your, because on the form they ask you, do you have criminal record? If they say no, you're lying. Technically we say no because you're juvenile, but I would say yes, number one. Number two then is we have to tell them the truth. They could also deny on discretion. So discretion means they don't like you. So on these type of cases, make sure you come up with equity, tell them about your parents, about how hard you work, about your tax return, and you're getting A's in high school. This is discretion and equity. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Wong, for this question. And I know uh, at least here in Atlanta, 
uh, and we know you are in Cleveland, and Cleveland people drive a lot uh, slower and more quiet. I don't know what it, uh, why that happens, but here in Atlanta, uh, we have a lot of people driving too fast, and that's why we have a lot of accidents. But also, there are some people that are blocking uh, freeways at night and doing this kind of drag racing, which is really, really dangerous and is not a good thing for a DACA beneficiary to be doing. So just uh, listen to Ms. Wong. She's giving you a good advice. Don't do anything stupid is what she uh, basically says uh, so many times. So we have more questions. And this next question is, um, so I have, I am a permanent resident, a legal permanent resident. I have been here for more than 10 years and I have my uh, green card for more than 10 years, but I don't speak English. I am 50 years old and I was told that I could do it in my language. I am from India. Good. This is a good question. There's a rule, I think it's 50, 15 or 60, 20. That means if you're over a certain age and you have the green card for more than a certain number of years, you don't need uh, to do to learn English. You could take the test in your foreign language. And if you're over like 72 years old, you need only to know 10 questions. And I, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer, but if you go to uscis.gov, it's right there. If not, next week, I promise you, and remind me that we I will give you an answer. I think it's 55, 10, or 62, 15, or something like that. There is a formula for that. Okay, I think it's, I've heard you before, I think it's 50 and 15 years or 55 and 10 years. I Perfect. Think that way. Yeah. Okay. So thank so you. So to much. answer this lady's question, because he she's just 50 and she's only 10. So she has to have another five years to get the green card to make it into 50 and 15. Okay. So oh. you need another five years of green card. Right. Okay. That's uh -huh. perfect. Thank you very, very much, Ms. Wong. Uh, we have more questions that are coming to our inbox. So let me read the, the, the next question uh, is about the citizenship. Can I go with my family or is, we are not allowed to do it now due to the COVID-19? That's a very good question. Uh, the, the question she's really asking is when I become swearing in, oh, right hand, when I uh, swear in to be a citizen, you are allow, you're not allowed to bring any guests. You could only go in half an hour ahead of time. Unless you're disabled, someone can push you in. If you need someone to help you in translating, you can go on the phone, but no guests. I think that's her question. So you're right, no family, no guests. Okay, that's, it's kind of sad, right? Um, it's okay. Is. As long as you become a citizen, you know, you already made yourself a citizen. It's so happy, you know, who cares? So I'll be there alone. Life is a lonely and alone, you know, it's lonely to be a CEO. Is when you're a baby, unless you have twins, you're alone. When a woman gives birth, you're alone. I mean, the husband could be there, the partner could be there, the spouse could be there, but you're still alone when you're giving birth. So becoming a citizen is so awesome that, you know, I thank the Lord. I mean, it's like, we're going to do this. Well, yeah. Uh, for example, Latino people, Ms. Wong, uh, I was told by a friend that was born here, and she said, well, the thing is that Latino people, for example, if someone is born today, they have to go to the hospital the same day, like the baby is not going to go out of the hospital. And uh, some other people from other countries, they just uh, wait until the baby is at home, and then they go and visit the mom and the baby. Uh, but uh, some people just want to go there to the hospital and make the party. In, in yeah. The <laughs> that's right. That's right. yeah. Actually, so when my happened. parents were in the hospital, when both of them were passing, we had parties in the hospital. You know, wow. that's right. All my Chinese friends, they came. Yeah, Chinese are like that. You know, we always have parties. Yeah, food and music yeah. when someone is very sick. Same thing. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, uh, we have uh, more questions. If you have any questions or you want further information, you can just call 216-279-3984.
216-279-3984. And Ms. Margaret Wong is going to answer every single question. So go, going back with the good news, DACA has been extended today and dreamers can live without fear for more uh, two more years. So it's good, congratulations, and we hope you do good in this time. And if you need help to do your DACA extension, for sure Ms. Wong can help you. Just call 216-279-3984. And we have more questions coming in um, through our inbox. So this next question is, um, my sister wants to come to the United States. She uh, doesn't want to stay in Venezuela. And she wants to come to Houston, but um, she was recommended to apply in Florida. Is that okay to do it if she's going to live in Texas to apply in Florida for the I-589? That's interesting. I think what happened is that she may be still in Venezuela and what airport maybe she's coming through. And maybe they uh, she was advised, I think, that Houston may be a better airport and maybe Miami airport is nicer to Venezuelans. Is, do you think that's a question? Because 539 is extension. So if it's filing for extension, it doesn't matter where you live because on the top left-hand corner, there's an address, but you can put any address. You can even put the hotel because most tourists are in the hotel. And then you can apply because it's a service center. On the web, they give you the address where you filed the 539. So I don't know if that's three questions here. Number one, I'm still in Venezuela. What's the best airport if I have a tourist visa to come? So she may be right. Houston is tough because Houston is just, you know, a tough airport. Maybe Miami is better. I prefer Atlanta. I prefer New York. That's who I prefer. New Newark is bad too. But maybe the question is I'm already in in Houston, but should I put my address as Miami because it's an easier place to do extension? 539 extension doesn't matter where you put because it's not approved locally in the district office. It's approved in service center. The third question is, if I want to stay here and overstay because of COVID-19, I cannot leave, where, where is the best address and when should I apply or should I even apply? Definitely apply, but you're ready to go take the receipt and go home with you. So I don't okay. really know what the question is. Yes. Perfect. Yeah, that, that's a, a very good answer is uh, about these people that want to do an extension. And about asylum, uh, some people, for example, Ms. Wong, uh, they live in one state, but they want to apply for asylum in other states because they have been told that judges or uh, immigration officers are uh, are more mild. Uh, but is that possible to do or it's illegal? You have to live there because like most asylees, because we came to America and as long as you file within a year. So it's not illegal because most of us who just came, we live in a relative's house for five days. We got kicked out and now we live in another house for six days. And, you know, it could be cross country. So, yes, it's not illegal to to shop for jurisdiction as long as you personally live there. So, for example, if I want to apply for citizenship, you have to have that six-month uh, resident and tax return to show you live there. For asylum, you don't need to show you live there as long as you live there at time of filing and at time of interview. But on the other hand, though, we need to be careful because I really don't want to play the system because there's so many people who really deserve to have asylum. So I don't want people to say, oh, you know, because this place is easier. And of course, I've been doing it 45 years. I know which is easier easier place. But I don't want us to play the system because already the public have an impression, oh, these foreign people, they're all bad people. They're all too smart. They're all, you know, and of course we're smart. If we're not smart, we would not be able to stay in long lines to yeah. apply for a visa, to stay in long lines in Mexico and come to America and cry and scream and be persistent and tenacious have grit, right? But there's so many deserving people that really have real marriages, real asylum cases, a real reason to stay and not overstay. Because once immigration pick up a bad law firm or a bad lawyer or a bad case, they assume everybody's lying. And I don't blame them because they're tired of their jobs. Just like I'm tired of now I'm so happy. I'm thinking I, I can go home because DACA passed, you know, I have no more job. But that's very good. So 
don't game the system because we're playing into Trump's hands on they're all bad people, they're all rapists, they're all this. But it's not just because one of us is a rapist doesn't mean all of us are rapists. One of us have a bad accident doesn't mean all of us have a bad accident, you know? Yeah. That's not nice. Yeah. Okay, so um, this last question for today. Um, I want to apply for a political asylum. I am from Mexico. Can I do that? Yes, it depends on your story. When I meant story, I love Steven Spielberg's uh, movies. I, there's a lot of movies I love. I love to read. Talk about reading a great book, Connie Schultz, the wife of, I know, I'm not supposed to say that. I've known both of them are good friends. But Connie Schultz is the wife of Senator uh Sherrod Brown, who really fights a lot for people like us. So does Connie. She just published a new book that I adore. I'm reading it. I think it's called Twin Daughters of Twin City. I just love it. And it's about Ohio. So please do look at the book, at least get the sample. I mean, I love the book. So I actually I got a free copy from her. So it's very, very nice. Um, coming back to um, the the sorry what's your question because i love to read i'm yeah, sorry the, yeah. the question was about a person who is from mexico if she can apply asylum yes yes asylum. yes you need to apply within a year on january 14th of 1994 new law came in and you have to apply for a year so absolutely if you have a good good i don't mean a story i mean that's why i talk about steven spielberg and Kanye Schultz. it's because you need to have that narrative it's not just, oh, I came illegally to America. Oh, I came when I was a child. Oh, I was raped. Oh, I was assaulted by a thing in a hut. I don't mean, I never saw the face. You know, the, it's very dark out there. Oh, is this, is that, right? So you have to have a good, good narrative and convince the officer, why did I miss my one year? Is it post-traumatic syndrome? Is it because I suddenly remembered it because my kid was three years old when it, this bad thing happened to me? Yes, you can still apply for asylum from Mexico, Isn't, even though it's more difficult because our administration doesn't like Mexico. Okay, well, thank you very much, Ms. Wong, for all your answers. And before we dismiss, uh, we would like for you to give a message about this DACA extension, anything you think is important right now. Congratulations, let's sever our victory. Two victories in two days, just an awesome. And from this very, very conservative US Supreme Court, and it's awesome. So sever it, enjoy it. Tomorrow will come another bad news. But today, let's be happy for these young people. Actually, we have quite some DACA kids working with us. So personally, I'm just so happy for them because I'm debating, oh, if they lose it, what am I going to do? I don't want to fire them because we trained them all these years. Oh, congratulations, everybody. I'm so happy for you. I mean, life is worth it. It's good. Thank, thank you, you very much, Ms. Wong, and thank you for loving what you do and the job you do uh, for encouraging people to fight for the rights and for encouraging your team to fight for the rights of everyone who is uh, going and talking to you and trying to find a solution to their immigration status. Thank you very, very much, Ms. Wong. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you very much, everyone, for all your questions. Just don't forget uh miss one can give you an advice a legal advice uh just calling 216-279-3984 216-279-3984 and she has offices in nine cities of the united states atlanta chicago cleveland columbus memphis uh minneapolis nashville uh, new york and raleigh north carolina thank you very much and see you next Thursday at 12.30 p.m. Thank you.